So let's get started with uh, momentum and impulse. This is in chapter 9 of my text. So momentum is basically um, defined as a quantity of motion. And so we'll start off by looking at uh, momentum and impulse. And so I'll start off first uh, by describing what happens when you strike an object. So most objects or every, every object has some level of elasticity. It just depends upon whether you can see it or not. So when you strike an object, the object may experience some deformation. And during that process of deformation, it means there's a force acting on it. That force is going to be a variable force which increases to a maximum. And then when the object rebounds, then the force decreases to zero again. So that's basically uh, that description of the variable force over a certain time is what we call the impulse. Okay, so let's start off uh, by looking at that. We will start off by defining, um, perhaps I should start off with momentum first. So we'll start off by defining momentum. So we'll say the momentum of an object is the mass multiplied by velocity. And so momentum is a vector quantity. So we we'll put that down. So we shall use the letter P for momentum. So we can say that momentum is equal to mass in kilograms multiplied by velocity in meters per second. So momentum can be written as m times v. So the unit of momentum is kilograms meters per second. So we can say that since momentum depends upon mass and velocity, for a given mass, a large velocity would mean a large momentum. And for a given velocity, a large mass would also mean a large momentum. So we can say that uh, for a given so we can say for a given velocity, a large mass will also imply a large momentum. We can apply the second law to uh, momentum. So let's suppose that. So we have an object of mass m moving with velocity v. Its momentum is given by p. So we can say p is equal to m times v. Okay. If we take the derivative of of the momentum, you can say that a derivative of momentum P gives, we shall say D dt of momentum is equal to D dt mv. Okay, so we shall say dp dt is equal to m d v d t okay and we know that d v d t is equal to a so you can say that this is just newton's second law so we can say that dp dt is equal to f which is equal to m times a so newton actually formulated the second law from using uh, momentum considerations so say newton's second law so Newton's second law follows from the change in momentum with respect to time. Okay. <coughs> so we can say that we can now see that from dp dt equals f. So if we start off with just a change in momentum dp dt equal to f of t, we can say that dp is equal to f of t dt. Therefore, if you just integrate both sides, you will see that p final minus p initial is equal to the integral from 0 to t, f of t dt. Now let me put a vector notation on there. So in one dimension, let's say x, uh, in one dimension, say the x dimension, then we can say that p final x minus p initial x is equal to, let's say, instead of t zero, we can say t initial t final f subscript x of t dt, like that. So that is a one dimensional case. We can go in one dimension <coughs> like that. Okay. So if we, if we have a variable force or if the force is variable, we can 
uh, at least we can have an idea how this works. So give me a second, uh, let me see. So let's define impulse. So we can say that uh, this formula leads us to impulse. And impulse, we shall use the letter J for impulse. So to define impulse, let's consider an object, uh, for example, a ball bouncing on the floor. So let's say it's bouncing on a hard floor. Okay. So imagine that the ball is just about to hit the floor. And so we can say just before it hits, it has an initial velocity V subscript I. And then when it initially starts hitting the floor, you can say that it has uh, hits at this point. There's going to be a force like that. And then uh, as it hits more or as it compresses more, you're going to have something like this. So the force is going to be a little bit more. We can say that this is fully compressed, so it has the highest force. And then it's bouncing, it's going to be bouncing up, so it has a force like that. As a slightly little less force. And then at this point, it's back up. Uh, sorry, hold on a second. So this would be V final. So this is F1, let's say F2, F3, F3. This will have F4, F5. Okay. So what we can do is plot a graph of the force against time. And what we'll see then is that for this object that is bouncing, the force starts off zero, increases to a peak, and then decreases back to zero like that. So this will be a function of F versus time. So the force increases to a peak and decreases to zero. And this occurs when that so at this point here the force is the, the peak here is this point here this will be uh, this will correspond to say f3 so this is the peak force okay so we can say that the force is variable it increases to a peak f3 and when the object leaves the ground as it bounces the force goes to zero okay so we shall see that for this object the area of the region under the graph of f of t under the graph of f of t versus t is called the impulse and uh, the impulse I'm, am i using i or j impulse j so it's called the impulse j okay so let me redraw this this is t this is f of t. You have something like that. So the area here is called impulse. And this impulse is just the integral of the region t initial, which is this t here. And this is t final. And the function or the graph is f of t dt. Okay, so I'm just integrating over that graph there. So that is our impulse. So if you take a look at this, you can see that this looks exactly like what we found earlier for momentum. Okay, so in one dimension, we can say j, uh, j in the x direction is equal to the integral t initial t final fx of t dt. Okay, so we see that this impulse j subscript x is just the same as p final minus p initial i think did i say x or not let's see p final uh, x yes p final x minus p initial x okay so this tells us that the change in momentum okay so this is the impulse is equal to p final x minus p initial x P final x minus P initial x is equal to momentum change, or let's say change in momentum, okay? Let's write change in momentum as delta P, if you like. And so this leads us to what is called an impulse momentum theorem. So since J subscript x is equal to delta P, we have the so-called impulse momentum theorem 
Okay, this is the impulse momentum theorem. This impulse momentum theorem just says that a change in momentum is equal to the impulse. This is actually a very useful theorem because it allows us to do a lot of different things without having to either know forces or um, import or momentum changes. So we can do a lot of things just by knowing the impulse momentum theorem. So to give you a quick summary, change in momentum delta P is equal to P final minus P initial impulse J is equal to the uh, integral of T initial T final Fx of T dt impulse is just the integral of the area under the graph and change in momentum is equal to impulse so we can write uh, P final minus P initial equals J and if you like you can write it as P final minus P initial in equal to the integral of T initial T final um, let me take the X away we don't we can put the dimensions in later f of t dt okay so this is basically the impulse momentum theorem so let's go to the next section and we'll do some exercises on solving impulse momentum theorem okay so we're going to solve a few impulse momentum theorems so let's start off with a few examples okay let me give you one last one okay so i've giving you a few exercises that you can try. They are all pretty straightforward exercises. So the first one is impulse. I've given you force and time, so you should be able to calculate impulse. Okay, so let's get some of the solutions. So for the first one, you are calculating impulse. So we said the impulse was, uh, impulse is just equal to um, F times the delta T or F delta T. Okay, so you can say F delta T is your impulse. It's just force times time. Basically, it's just the area of the region under the graph. So if your force is constant, then you're just multiplying the force by the time interval. Okay, so the force is 5,000 Newtons multiplied by the time interval. What was the time? 0.5. Okay. So what does that give us? Okay, is everybody getting that? Yes. <coughs> if we integrate the, the formula, also yeah. it should be the same, right? Yeah, because the force is constant. It shouldn't matter whether you integrate it or not. Yeah. The only problem is that you have to choose a time interval. You can certainly integrate it. You, know, you just put the 5,000 in there, and then you would, the delta T would just be 0.5. And that's all. So you just take an interval, maybe 1 to 1.5 seconds or whatever. So that when you take the difference between the time, you get 0.5. Any questions? Okay, the second example. Example 2. So the first example was impulse. Second one is change in momentum. So the ball is thrown at a wall and sticks to the wall when it hits. The ball has an initial velocity of 25 meters per second and a mass of 50 grams. What is the change in momentum of the ball? Okay, change in momentum. Okay, did anyone get an answer? 1.25. Yeah. Okay. Negative. So let me write that first. Change in momentum. So delta P is equal to minus 1.25. What is the unit? Kilograms meters per second. Okay, so change in momentum is equal to uh, mass times velocity change, if you like. Okay, so you can certainly set it up that way. So the change in momentum should be equal to the mass. Uh, 50 grams is 0 0.05 kilograms multiplied by the moment the velocity change which is 0 minus 25 so that should give you the negative 1.25 kilograms meters per second okay any questions on that now let's go to example 3 uh, in this example example 3 change in momentum and impulse so what is the change in momentum on this one 
16 kg meter per second. We have 16 what? Kg meter per second. And somebody also says zero. Zero. Okay. So in this exercise, a 400 gram bowling ball strikes the ground initially at 20 meters and bounces upward at the same speed. What is the change in momentum and impulse? Before we go on, what is the impulse then? Anyone? Well, the impulse is equal to change in momentum. So once you calculate the change in momentum, then you also have impulse. So what is the impulse? MD final minus M. Just give me the number. Four eight. Eight. We have eight. Minus. We know the impulse momentum theorem tells us that change in momentum is equal to impulse. So once you calculate your change in momentum, that should be equal to impulse. Oh, it should okay. be eight minus minus eight. So okay. Minus yeah, eight minus, minus eight. So okay. So it will be sixteen. That's the whole point. So yeah. I wanted you to tell me sixteen. Because change in momentum should be equal to impulse. So change in momentum should be equal to mass times change in velocity. So you have 400 grams, which is 0.4 kilograms. Change in velocity, the final velocity is the same as the initial, but it's bouncing upward. So you can say the final is going to be 20 meters per second minus the initial velocity of 20 meters per second like that so it was 20 wasn't it yeah, yeah. so you're going to have uh, 0 0.4 kilograms times 40 uh, meters per second which is 0 uh, which is 16 okay so the change in momentum is 16 that tells us that the impulse is also 16 okay Okay, so impulse is 16 kilograms meters per second also. And then we have the last example there. So in this example, we are calculating uh, impulse over a time interval that's given there. So what is the impulse? Post time, post multiplied by time cubes. Okay, like that. So what is the impulse? I got 56. So we have a 34. We have 56. Okay. Does that impulse equal the integral of the force? Right. So in this case, I gave you f of t is 3t squared uh, plus 2t, I believe. Let's just double check. So the impulse, you can calculate. And I think I gave you 1 to 3 seconds. 1 to 3 seconds. Say 1 to 3. Okay, so you're going to have, integrate that, you're going to have, um, let's see. Uh, t cubed plus. Okay. So you said this was equal to 34. Yeah. Okay, thank you. What do we need the 50 gram? Yeah. Right, you don't need it. It's just, uh, yeah. yeah, you don't need that. Yeah. Okay. Any questions on all what we've done so far? Okay, let's go to the next item, uh, next section there, which is uh, conservation of momentum. So, so far we've seen how objects interact when they collide with each other. We can now look at uh, momentum conservation. Let's consider the collision of two objects, or which I call it an interaction. Okay, so let's consider, uh, let's consider a few masses uh, interacting in an enclosure. Okay, so we can say we have this enclosure here with mass m1. Uh, let me see if I can make it bigger. Hold on a second. So this will be m1, m1. A second. Let's say this is m2. And this can be M3. Let's say they are in an enclosure where they collide with each other. So this is, this is an in, a system of interacting objects, system of interacting masses, if you like. 
So this mass, this will be uh, this will be the force of one on three, force of one on two. There will be a force of three on two, and so on. So there are multiple forces acting. I'll just draw a few of them. Force of three on one, and then this is the force of two on one. So we're gonna have multiple forces like that. So I think I've not drawn all the forces, but I just wanted to show you a few of the forces present. So we can say that in this system, three masses interacting. So we can say that there are forces between the masses. Okay, and so I'll just list the forces here. So force of one on three and force of one on two is one pair of force. And then in return, there's a force of, so this is an, let me list the action forces and the reaction forces first. So these are action forces, force of one on three, force of one on two. Um, then there's a force of uh, three, force of three on one and force of two on one. Okay. And then we can have the force of uh, 3 on 2 and the force of 2 on 3. So these are action-reaction pairs. These action-reaction pairs are internal forces. Okay, so they cancel each other out. So let's say we apply Newton's second law to this system. We can say that the change in momentum uh, is equal to a net external force by Newton's second law. So we can say that if there is a net force, F net, then there is a change in momentum. And then we can say that if there is no force and there is no change in momentum over time, okay, so we can look at it this way. So we can say that momentum total of this system is equal to momentum of one plus momentum of two plus momentum of three, where momentum of one is just equal to mass times velocity of one, but we are not going to talk about velocity since we've left those out. So we can say that, um, let's see, so the total momentum, let's put this in vector notation, is equal to the sum uh, from one to three. This is just for this uh, three mass system. If, of course, if you have uh, multiple masses, then you are going to, uh, if you have multiple masses, you are just going to add them all up, of course. So we can say that for n masses, then we can say dp total dt is equal to uh, 1 to n dpi dt. And we know that this is just equal to the net force, like that. And so we are saying that, consider the system again. So if we have this box like this, and you have a mass one, two, three, and you have some force coming in like that. Okay, so let's bring a force from this direction. So this is F external, F external. Okay, so this is M1, M2. M3 again. So this is the external force on the system. So that external force is the force that we are referring to. So we're saying that if the sum of all, if I goes from 1 to N, Fi is equal to F external, then we can say that dP total dT is equal to F external. So if there's a net external force, then there's a change in momentum over time. If F external is equal to zero, then we can say that dP total dT is equal to zero, which means that the change in momentum is equal to zero. So momentum final is equal to momentum initial. So we can say dP 
delta is equal to zero, or we can say delta p is equal, change in momentum is equal to zero, therefore, momentum final is equal to momentum initial. Okay, this is called momentum conservation. Okay, this is the momentum conservation principle. It just tells us that if there is no net external force on a system of interacting objects, the change in momentum of the system is zero. So momentum conservation just means that the final momentum is equal to the initial momentum. Remember that momentum is a vector quantity. Let me put vector notations here. Okay, so we are talking about a change in momentum, meaning that both the uh, vector, both the magnitude and the direction must remain unchanged. Okay, so let's look at that again. So if you consider a system of n particles, and we're just going to work along uh, in two dimensions. So in a system in two dimensions, we can uh, work it out this way. We can say that for x dimension, what is that one? P yeah. P yeah. Hold on a second. Which one? P final equals P initial. Sorry, this is P final equals P initial. So dimension in X dimension, you can say that P final 1X plus P final for the second plus P final for third X and so on should be equal to P initial X for first one and we can do the same for the y dimension so p final y1 plus p final y2 and so on should be equal to p initial y1 plus p initial uh, y2 p initial y m something like that so you will do this for both for every object in the x direction for both initial and final momenta and then for objects in the y direction for both initial and final momenta. Okay. So let's look at a strategy for solving momentum conservation problems. So the first thing we shall do is to identify the objects in the system. So let's identify the interacting masses. Let's just call them masses because that's what we're going to be using identify interacting masses and number two uh, write the total momentum before interaction so you can say that write the total momentum of the system before it interacts and write the total momentum of the system after interacting and then finally you set them equal to each other so set the total momentum before equal to the total momentum after so we can look at an example uh, next okay, so uh, let's look at the example in the next section Let's look at inelastic collisions in the next section. So inelastic collisions will be collisions where the two objects will stick together after colliding. We will say in these collisions, so they will stick together and move with the same velocity after colliding. And so uh, let's consider a mass, uh, two masses. So we consider a mass M moving with velocity V and colliding with another mass so let's say this mass is also m and this mass is at rest so the question is what is the final velocity of the two masses so they stick together after collision okay, so let's draw a system like this so we have a mass m uh, moving with velocity v and this mass is going to collide with another mass m and this mass is at rest so this is before collision and then we can write after collision so after they collide we will say that the two masses stick together and they move up with the final velocity v final like that so this is m and that's m okay so we can use our strategy uh, for solving this kind of problem so we write the total momentum of the system before collision so strategy Number one, momentum total before 
is equal to the momentum of the first mass. Let's label them 1 and 2 just to separate them initially. So momentum of 1 plus momentum of 2. And momentum of 1 is mass times velocity. Momentum of 2 is 0 since it's at rest. And then number 2, momentum total after the collision would be equal to momentum of 1 plus 2 times V final. Uh, sorry, not that way. The mass of 1 plus 2. So it's the mass of those two objects. So it's going to be equal to M plus M times V final like that. Okay, so after the collision, they are stuck together and moving off with velocity V. So I say the masses are added together. And then the third step is momentum total before is equal to momentum total after. So we set them equal to each other. So we can say that M times V is before, and that's equal to M plus M times V final. So we can say MV is equal to 2MV final, therefore V final is half of V. So when you have the two equal masses uh, colliding, one of them is at rest and one of them is moving in velocity V, when they collide, the final speed is half of the speed that the first mass had. Let's try an example. We can say a uh, one kilogram bowling ball moving at two meters per second collides with a second uh, one kilogram rolling ball at rest. If both balls uh, stick together, both balls stick together, what is the uh, final speed? Okay, pretty straightforward. We have two exercises there that we can try. The first one is pretty straightforward. Second one is a little bit, uh, just one extra step beyond what I gave you on the first one. So it's pretty straightforward also. Okay, so let's get some of the answers. So in the first exercise, it's just a lot like the example that we did. So what is the answer for the final speed? So in this exercise, V final can be found by just take, saying that V final is half of V since the masses are equal. Okay, so you're basically just using MV equals 2MV. So V final is half of V. So it's going to be just half times 2, which is 1 meter per second. So that's pretty straightforward, all right? Uh, the second exercise is also straightforward. Let's take a look. Okay, example two. So in this exercise, you are setting it up the same way. You have the two. Well, let me get your answer first. What is V final? Anyone? 0.15 meters per second. 0.15. And uh, which direction is that? To the right. To the right. Okay, so your positive answer. Okay. So you have the two masses, let's say this is M1, second mass is M2, V1, V2. So V1 is 2 meters per second, and V3, uh, sorry, V2 is 1.5. This is negative because it's moving to the left. The masses are 400 and 450 grams. Okay, so when you set it up, your momentum before is going to be equal to M1 V1 plus M2 V2. Okay, so one of them is moving this way, one is moving that way. And then the momentum after is equal to M1 plus M2 V final, since they are stuck together. And we set them equal to each other. We're going to say M1 V1 plus M2 V2 equals M1 plus M2 V final, like that. So V final is going to be M1 V1 plus M2 V2 divided by M1 plus M2. So you just plug in the numbers. And in this case, if you even if you didn't change the uh, masses to kilograms, it should be okay because the unit will cancel out. Uh, so we can have 400 times 2 
minus 450 times 1.5 divide that by 400 plus 450 so hopefully when you solve that you should have the answer 800 uh, minus 450 times 1.5 6 75. 75 thank you divided by 850 50. okay like that yeah, what is that it's supposed to be positive. Oh, sorry. Yes, thank you. Sorry. Okay, good. So V final is equal to what was it? One point zero point one five. Thank you. Zero point one five meters per second. Is everybody getting that? Yeah. Oh, okay, good. All right. Uh, let's go to the next item there, which is uh, explosion nine point five. So explosions are basically the same as uh, basically momentum conservation type problems. Okay, so we can say an explosion can be analyzed. Uh, an explosion can be analyzed by momentum conservation. Uh, let me rewrite that. Explosion can be analyzed by momentum conservation. And so when we analyze uh, uh, an explosion, we can um, we can apply the same strategy. We write the total momentum before and total momentum after. So we can say, let's consider a mass M that is initially at rest. It breaks into two parts of mass, two parts of mass M1 and M2. So we can say the parts move with velocities uh, V1 and V2. So typically what we can uh, do with this is to say, let's find the velocity of one of the masses. We can say a typical, so we say a typical exercise is to find the velocity of one of the masses after the explosion. So we have the mass like that, M, initially at rest, so V equal to zero. So this is the before condition. And then after, you have one mass like that. Let's call this M1, moving with velocity V1. And the other mass is like that. This is V2, and this mass is M2. So we can apply the same principle, momentum conservation. So we say that the momentum total before is equal to uh, M times V, which is equal to zero, because the initially the momentum was zero, the mass was at rest. And then finally, the momentum after is equal to minus M1 V1 plus M2 V2. So we say momentum total before is equal to momentum total after. So we can say momentum before was zero and that should be equal to minus M1 V1 plus M2 V2. Therefore we'll say that M1 V1 is equal to M2 V2. And so if we wanted to find V1, then we'll say that V1 is something like that. So this is an example of an explosion where you are solving for one of the uh, velocities. One of them is a, you can consider one to be recoil and the other one to be the uh, actual velocity. Let's try an example. Okay, example. So let's find the recoil velocity of the gun. We can say the gun and bullets are initially at rest. Okay, so try this exercise. This is the same as an explosion type problem, so you can try that. Uh, 5 kilograms, 50 kilograms, this is 1000 meters per second is the, the velocity of the bullet. Gun and bullet are initially at rest. Okay, so what is the solution? One. What? Okay, you have one meter per second. So this exercise is a lot like what I described earlier. So you have a gun with a bullet in it. Okay, so what? You have 10? Yeah. Okay. And then after the, the gun fires, 
the bullet goes this way and the gun goes that way so this is V recoil and this is V bullet so momentum before is equal to I'm putting mg to be mass of gun and vg velocity of gun okay so that's zero momentum after is equal to mass of gun velocity of recoil this is plus mass of bullet velocity of bullet so we can put a negative sign since the gun goes one way the bullet goes the other so momentum before is equal to momentum after therefore zero is equal to minus mass of gun velocity of recoil plus mass of bullet velocity of so velocity of recoil is just going to be mass of bullet velocity of bullet divided by mass of gun so what is the answer 10 okay okay 